phosphate pentose phosphate pathway. Uh, it has an oxidative phase and a non-oxidative phase. So we went through the oxidative phase, and that's where we make NADB. NADPH and release some carbon dioxide. And we also generate ribulose 5-phosphate. So that's this uh, circular pathway up top here. All this, right? right? Um, however, we didn't cover the non-oxidative phase. And I remind you that um, you know, it can be a goal for the cell to have uh, NADPH and, and five carbon sugars. You know, this can go on to form DNA and so forth. But there are um, other possibilities as well. Um, so let's take a look at the oxidative phase. So this looks like a lot, right? Um, I want you to understand right off the bat that these, if I put a line here, these are the same thing on the left and the right. One is just simplified to show carbon numbers, but they are the same thing. So we can get ribose 5-phosphate out of the non-oxidative phase if ribulose is converted to ribose. And um, in turn, this can be uh, isomerized, epimerized into xylulose 5-phosphate. We actually looked at that, right? Uh, also part of the non-oxidative phase, actually. So, What's the big picture here? It's, it's a little crazy looking, right? So basically what's gonna happen here is we have two different enzymes that are going to transfer short carbon segments from one compound to another compound. So Overall, it's a series of rearrangements that takes six five carbon molecules and converts them to five six carbon molecules. Six carbon molecules sound suspiciously like things like glucose, right? Or fructose. So in the process of transferring these carbon moieties, courtesy of these two different enzymes, transketolose and transaldolase, what's happening in the beginning is that we have these two five carbon sugars, right? Five carbon here, and then five carbon down here. So if we take two carbons from one, let's say we're taking the two carbons from ribose 5-phosphate, uh, or actually from uh, xylulose 5-phosphate, we take the two carbons and we give it to the ribose. We make, so this is plus two carbons, right? That were moved from the xylulose and forming a seven carbon sugar here. This is minus two carbons because it's given it away, right? And we have three carbons here. So it doesn't stop there though. This, this madness continues. And then <laughs> next up, transaldolase, what's happening here? Well, this is a six carbon sugar, right? So we must be taking away a one carbon moiety from cetoheptulose 7-phosphate minus one carbon, and we're pushing it over here, right, to get a four carbon erythrose. Now, fructose 6-phosphate can be converted to glucose 6-phosphate, and here we need for this reaction here with this erythrose 4 phosphate, we bring in another xylulose 5 phosphate, 
What are we doing this time where we're adding two carbons here to get to fructose 6-phosphate? So this is back to transketolase. Notice that the transaldolase is um, uh, transferring a one carbon segment while the transketolase does a two carbon segment. So the transketolase is gonna give uh, two carbons from xylulose 5-phosphate to erythrose and we're going to get fructose 6-phosphate. And then xylulose, we're going to take away two carbons again. So this is similar to the first reaction. The only, time, the only difference is now we have erythrose 4-phosphate instead of ribose 5-phosphate. And then we get uh, fructose 6-phosphate and G3P, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. However, we said that we're, we, we were, were um, taking six five-carbon molecules and making five six-carbon molecules, right? So far, we've made what? We've made one six carbon molecule, two six carbon molecules. <laughs> well, total, Let's, let me try that again. These are two six carbon molecules, right? And we have a G3P here as well, which is a three carbon molecule. Now, if we take this whole shebang right here, with our, and we do it, do you see what's going on here? This is like happening, it's getting a little messy. Let me get rid of some things. Let's just focus on the right hand now. So this is basically what we have here times, what we have on this side times two, right? You see how that's working? We have everything that's described here, once here, and a second time here. You see that? Everybody cool with that? Okay. So that means these two three carbon molecules, this G3P that formed here. Yeah. What? Yeah, you see it now? What? Yeah. So, well, we're not really multiplying. We're actually we're reacting them, right? We're, we're taking two G3Ps and we're forming uh, uh, a glucose 6-phosphate, actually. So in summary, we do get our one, two, three, four, five, six carbon molecules. Pretty insane, right? Uh, so a couple things um, continued recycling leads to the conversion of glucose 6 phosphate to 6 CO2. So why am I saying that? Because it looks like this is a zero sum game right now, right? But if we think back to the non-oxidative phase, we lose a CO2 every time. So technically we have six cycles. I, I mean, I meant to say the oxidative phase. Thank you. Yeah, the ox. Every time we go through the oxidative phase, um, and this this does uh, the the non-oxidative does produce glucose six phosphate. So so there are only potentially six cycles possible. It's just a math thing. Uh, so. These two enzymes are in fact unique to the pentose phosphate pathway. And we're gonna look a little more closely at these uh, carbon transfers, these carbon conversions or whatever you wanna call it. So, uh, so here we are with um, our pathway again and um, with the actual molecules themselves. So here we have our xylulose 5-phosphate, which is this molecule, and our ribose 5-phosphate, which is this molecule, right? 
So these two things, as we noted, uh, this group from xylulose 5-phosphate, and that's a keto group, right, is actually transferred here at the aldehyde um, of our ribose. And courtesy of the coenzyme TPP in combination with transketolase, we get uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is here, right? And said ceto or ceto, 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 what do you vote for? <laughs> ceto heptulose um, seven phosphate, which we have up here. So this is, we'll put our TK here, right? Transketolase. But we know the next one is a transaldolase. So, um, but for now, we're just showing this part, this first part right here, the production of cetoheptulose. Uh, uh, 7 phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So um, we're going from a ketose donor to an aldehyde acceptor, right? Or an aldo sugar acceptor. Now the transaldolase reaction. Now this is uh, kind of interesting because it looks like exactly the same reaction. Um, You know, I think I made a mistake. No, I did not make a mistake. Going from seven carbons to six carbons here. And three carbons to four carbons. So this here is going to, you know, I said one carbon, but that's wrong. When I was back here, we're actually taking three carbons this time and moving it to, remember back here, I think I made a little error. We're taking minus you guys might have to help me out here. <laughs> so this is seven carbons and this is three carbons. So we're adding we're adding plus three to this, right? And it's making fructose six phosphate. And we're taking minus three from here and it's making, or there, okay. Okay, I was showing this incorrectly. I was, I was saying it was like sedulose hop, uh, we were losing a carbon from sedulo heptose seven phosphate, but we're not. We're actually taking three carbons away from sedulose, sedio, sedulose, <laughs> saying these words, Cito, hep, whatever. We're taking three carbons away from this, right? And that makes erythrose four phosphate, right? The three carbons that we've taken away, we're giving to fructose six phosphate. Now I wanna revisit this one as well to make sure I'm doing this right. We're taking the carbons away from xylulose. Here. Okay, so that's right. And we're giving it to ribose. So yeah, it's more like this, right? You can spend some time with this, but what what's the moral of the story here? Transketolase enzyme is transferring a two carbon segment. Okay, let's look at that again here two carbon segment, right? Two ribose five phosphate, that gives us a seven carbon uh, here and a three carbon here. Cool? That's, it's really not that fundamentally co complicated. I mean, it's a very complicated sequence of events, but what we're looking at right here is not complicated. We're taking a two, two carbon keto group here and we're giving it to an aldehyde. End of story.
In the transaldolase reaction, we're taking a three carbon keto and we're giving it to glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So this is a similar reaction, right? We're taking keto and giving it to aldehyde, um, but it is not the same reaction and it is not the same enzyme. So in this case, we're going, we're looking at this part of the, of this pathway, right? This right here. And we get erythrose four phosphate and fructose six phosphate. What happens next? Uh, we go back to transketolase, okay? And this time these are gonna be our players. Back to a two carbon transfer here. We're taking uh, two carbons away from our xylulose. So that becomes a three carbon sugar. And we're taking, we're adding two carbons here. And we're making G3P and fructose six phosphate. And then as you may recall, this three carbon will combine with another three carbon if we were to just, you know, rewrite this pathway kind of flipped on itself right below this. We'd have another three carbon G3P that could combine with the second molecule of G. The two G3Ps could combine together to make our six carbon sugars. Okay, so what have we done? Well, we've made a good amount of sugars here, uh, starting from ribose and xylulose. We've gotten a lot of glucose 6 phosphate and fructose 6 phosphate. A few words about TPP. There's a pretty, um, so TPP, I'm going to remind you, is uh, a coenzyme for the transketolase reaction. And uh, in the process of this reaction, uh, a carbanion intermediate is formed. So the TPP uh, has a ring structure that can stabilize that carbanion. If you're interested in this mechanism uh, for uh, pyruvate decarboxylase reaction, there is a detailed description of this mechanism. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it in, in gory detail, but I just, this is an opportunity to, uh, to point out the importance of these coenzymes, right? Uh, this is a, a, a crucial role. This coenzyme is, is playing a crucial role in stabilizing this carbon anion um, intermediate, which is quite unstable if left to its own devices. And um, transaldolase has a similar strategy um, to achieve resonance stabilization, but in a very different way. Um, it actually has an intermediate uh, that involves uh, the, there's a lysine in the active site of the transaldolase enzyme, and it can perform resonance stabilization, again, of a carbon ion intermediate to help this reaction go forward. Okay, so um, there are four steps in the pentose phosphate oxidative pathway. These are essentially irreversible. All of these non-oxidative reactions that we just looked at are readily re re reversible. So um, the question arises is which pathway is pursued and when? So um, glucose 6-phosphate is partitioned between glycolysis, of course. We know uh, glucose 6-phosphate is the first intermediate of the glycolytic pathway, right? And the pentose phosphate pathway. So Why sometimes does glucose 6-phosphate 
go for glycolysis and why in other situations is it directed to the pentose phosphate pathway? Well, one major consideration is relative concentrations of NADP plus and NADPH. So if we're low in NADP plus, uh, I mean, if we're low in NADPH, rather, we're low in NADPH, this is going to stimulate the pentose phos phosphate pathway. But if we have an abundant supply of NADPH, this is going to inhibit. So we've got our little inhibition sign here, right? If we have plentiful stores of NADPH, the tendency is not to go towards the pentose phosphate pathway, but rather to be directed towards glycolysis. So it's really um, all about the ratio of NADP plus to NADPH. Okay. Okay, so that was a complicated pathway. So I, uh, by the way, um, this is pretty much copied from the textbook. And I put this in here because the textbook does have some actually good summaries. So, um, and it's something you can use when you're studying to uh, get the big picture of what the pentose phosphate pathway is in this case, right? And also, you know, as you're thinking about the big picture, it also gives you an opportunity to think about some of the details, right? Like, do you know the details? Can you sort of think about this in a more detailed way than what's being presented in the summary? So, um, so I don't know. I don't. I don't think I should read this. Maybe you should read this. <laughs> Maybe you should read this right now and tell me if you have any questions. I had a question for myself when I read this, when I was preparing, I had a question about this. And also, I have a little bit of a, I mean, I guess I, I ask myself when I read this, is this really the whole story of why glucose um, 6-phosphate enters into either glycolysis or the pentose phosphate pathway? Because if we go back to the beginning, we don't just want, um, NAD, why? And also I see a mistake here. <laughs> I think it's supposed to say NADP plus and NADPH, not NAD. So one of the reasons I, I, I paused here is it says two oxidations, but if you recall, yes, two oxidations, but in fact, four reactions, something to think about, oxidative phase one, oxidative phase two. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the relative concentrations of uh, NADP plus and NADPH, um, I mean, there are other reasons for going through the pentose phosphate as well, right? Because we need these uh, ribose sugars. Uh, uh, so if we were low in, in ribose sugars, we might also want to pursue this pathway, right? So always read things, try to read things or think about things with a critical, with a critical eye, because no summary can tell. I mean, there's 
we're not telling complete stories here in biochemistry, right? I mean, these systems are so complex, right? We're just, we're, we're hitting the high points. And, and actually, this is a good, this would be a good time to introduce this slide. Uh, hang on, hang on. This is, whoops. This is a map of metabolic pathways. And to say things are interconnected would be a bit of an understatement, right? So when I say, you know, oh, the pentose phosphate pathway will go forward because we need uh, more NADPH, I mean, the interconnections here are like just ridiculously complex and interconnected, right? So um, gives the subway map a run for its money, definitely. <laughs> okay, so now we can actually move on to, what's going on with this? Something is strange with this. Anyway, um, let me share some new slides here for the benefit of, oops. No. Oh, I know what my problem is. Okay, hang on. Let's keep Let's do a new share. Okay, so now we're going to move on to metabolism of glycogen. We've looked at metabolism of glucose. We've looked at synthesis of glucose. So we've looked at glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Now we can look at both the breakdown and synthesis of glycogen. Before we get there, we want to understand a little bit about um, the whys and wherefores, and we'll delve a little bit into the structure of glycogen. But something I would hazard to say that we already know is that um, as vertebrates, we and other animals require, or other organisms require a ready fuel. That's not just as ready as glucose, but is a ready uh, fuel either um, ingested in our diet or stored somewhere in our body. So um, in particular, we need a ready source of fuel for brain and muscle. And since we already uh, have studied in a preliminary way, the structure of glycogen, we know more or less what it is and um, that it is the polymerization of glucose into a branched molecule in animals, it is found primarily in the muscle and even more so in the liver. So if we break glycogen down directly in the muscle, this can get uh, a glucose energy source going for muscle, within, for muscle contraction within seconds. And if it's stored in the liver, we have a reservoir because the liver, as I've mentioned previously, is really in the business of regulating the availability of glucose in the body overall, i.e. homeostasis. Okay, so we looked at a first level of glycogen structure back when we were talking about carbohydrates, but there's more to it than that. Glycogen actually forms granules, which um, are composed of many tiers of these branch chains of glycogen molecules. So there are theory in terms of size, structure, and location, but what they do have in common is that they are concentric layers of glycogen molecules. So um, the next layer of structure 
is the, and, and I would say a higher level of structure are the alpha granules, which um, include protein and are simply 20 to 40 clustered beta granules. So if this is our beta granule here, and we can kind of get a feel for these concentric layers here, right? Um, these come together to form the alpha particle. So higher level of structure. Um, needless to say, given uh, the higher complexity of the structure, um, these release glucose more slowly than beta granules. Uh, they will be present, these alpha granules will be present in well-fed an animals, but get used up or are absent after a 24 hour fast. And they do provide many of these non-reducing ends for the release of glucose, um, which is what we want when we're seeking out a source of energy. Okay, so we've already talked about uh, a number of fates for glucose 6-phosphate. We were just talking about um, whether it goes to glycolysis or whether it goes to the penthouse phosphate pathway. Um, as you can imagine, that's not it. That's not the end of the story for um, glucose 6-phosphate. It can be used uh, to synthesize the polysaccharides found in the extracellular matrix. It can be used to synthesize glycogen, of course. Um, uh, it can be, if it's in the liver, for example, it can be hydrolyzed. It can be stored in the liver as glucose. It, there can be a ready source of glucose 6-phosphate in the liver that can be hydrolyzed to glucose and released from the liver to replenish blood glucose. And um, there are just a lot of things that can happen here. It can be used to synthesize a bunch of other sugars, not just uh, glycogen as we talked about, but things like glucosamine, galactose, galactosamine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and even uh, can be partially degraded to provide acetyl-CO, well, this is a little complicated, but you know, sometimes acetyl-CO, we go from glucose 6-phosphate to, to pyruvate. Um, we get uh, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, which we haven't have actually even talked about yet. That acetyl-CoA can go through the citric acid cycle, but it can also be used for fatty acid and sterol synthesis. So think again, the map, right? Like just many possibilities all interconnected. But for now, we're going to keep it simple. <laughs> we're going to look at glycogen synthesis and breakdown uh, and uh, consider how the chemistry works and how, how it's regulated. Because, you know, once again, this is a situation of similar to glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Are we going to break it down or are we going to build up? And um, what's controlling that? What enzymes are controlling that? What is it going to be phosphorylation again as the technique to control the enzymes or, or what's it going to be? So, um, okay, we already talked about this slide. Uh, as I say, this is just something to contemplate. And if you're uh, interested uh, in metabolomics, you know, you can make a whole career out of it if you want to. So, and you can imagine this is very much a computational kind of field as well, right? Uh, okay, so. Um, Say what? You know, I don't know. You're 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 triggering distant memories because I know I've learned about the keg pathway and and I've sort of forgotten even what that is. What is the keg pathway? It's in the textbook. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a whole database. That's right. I have Let's take a look. Yeah, it could they call it a for Let's take a look at what this is.
Yeah, so I think this is going to be a similar looking, not identical, but so this is a database that contains information about all this. This looks even more frightening than, than what we were just looking at a moment ago. Um, I recognize at least something here. <laughs> What's this? That citric acid cycle. But yeah, I mean, fun to look at this stuff. Like, I mean, it, and this is like many of the things are in here that, you know, we're not going to be talking about steroid biosynthesis. Uh, I mean, there's just so many things that we're not even touching on in this course that go on uh, in, in metabolism, right? Amazing, just amazing. So yeah, and I, I encourage you to explore this stuff. It's fascinating. And you can imagine the computational work that goes into developing a database of this nature, right? It's just, it's just unreal. And every, you know, kind of metabolism is broken down here. Things that we, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> okay. So, Okay, so glycogenolysis, guess what? The breakdown of glycogen. Glycogenesis, the synthesis of glycogen. We're gonna talk about both. Glyc starting with glycogenolysis. So um, we already said this statement here, ready source of energy. Uh, a few more things in that regard. Uh, we actually have greater stores of energy and fat than we do in us in the form of glycogen. About 100 times more energy is typically stored uh, in the form of fat. But um, a couple things. We cannot metabolize fat into glucose. I mean, if we had just the glycerol molecule, yes, potentially we could make some glucose, but really not the name of the game with lipids. Um, we use uh, um, glycogen to get... I mean, we, yeah, we, I mean, with fat, it would be getting the glycerol and then synthesizing some, the, the glycerol, using glycerol to synthesize some glucose, but we cannot break down a fatty acid into glucose, right? We can break down carbohydrate uh, uh, glycogen stores into glucose. So one of the things that facilitates this whole process, as we have talked about, is that the structure of these glycogen granules um, provide a lot of non-reducing ends to be attacked by the enzyme that we're gonna learn about in a moment to release these glucose phosphate mon monomers. So um, good, clever form of storage for its purpose. What is the enzyme in question? Well, this is uh, from uh, protein database. This is a JMOL. So we're looking at glycogen phosphorylase here. And um, this is the enzyme that's going to free our glucose monomers, free at last, from the glycogen molecule or molecules. So once they're released, we know they can undergo glycolysis. We know skeletal muscles in particular are going to need this for burst of activity. And um, again, the liver can actually remove that phosphate and allow free glucose to be transported out into the blood when we don't have enough dietary glucose. So um, this is the, the setting. How does this glycogen phosphorylase work? Well, um, as mentioned, it attacks the non-reducing ends of our glycogen chains. It requires uh, a cofactor PP or pyridoxal phosphate. And interestingly, I kind of love this little detail. It acts repetitively until it reaches a point four residues away, four residues away from one of these alpha one to six branch points. This leads me to wonder if there's like a little elf in the body holding up a stop sign saying, <laughs> right? Saying like, 
no more, you're four residues away. <laughs> I mean, how does that work, right? Um, I mean, it must have structural, you know, re there, there's got to be reasons, but sometimes you just have to like marvel at this, right? It's like, no more, <laughs> go this way. Uh, detour. So, uh, okay, so how does that look? Well, you know, these not, you know, we could have an indeterminate length of our branch, right? So we don't know exactly how many glucose mo molecules we're reaching, but we do know that um, there is this stopping point once we're four residues away from the branch point itself. Um, so these are our, what, what are we looking at in these figures here? Well, we're looking at, you know, a non-reducing end, and then we're looking at the release of, note it's glucose one phosphate at this point, it's not glucose six phosphate. Um, and each time our chain is shortened by, you guessed it, one monomer. So uh, I don't think there's anything much more to say there. Uh, this, this here points out, you know, the, the non-reducing ends. And here we have an alpha one to six linkage here. So we see where, where this is going to work, right? Okay, now we don't wanna, however, just stop when the, uh, and leave these four remaining glucose monomers. Well, not monomers at this point, but these four available glucose molecules it would be silly just to not use them, right? Because we still have some glucose molecules to release here. So um, we have something called a debranching enzyme. <laughs> one of the few, one of the few, uh, the very simple name, right? Debranching enzyme, nothing, nothing fancy. What does it do? It actually does something quite interesting. It takes three of these residues. So if you focus on, well, let's start, from, take it from the top here. So we, uh, glycogen phos uh, phosphorylase, right, comes in and it removes all of these blue until we get to this point right here. Now we have four more residues here, one, two, three, four. And the next thing that happens is this uh, enzyme, which is bifunctional, releases a segment of three. What does it do with them? Does it put them in the trash? No, it takes them and it moves them. It has a transferase activity. So it simply moves them to a neighboring chain. Okay. And then um, we still have, after this has happened, after these three yellow glucose uh, molecules have been moved to a neighboring chain. We still have this one left, and then this bifunctional enzyme has a glucose cytase activity to cleave this remaining glucose monomer, and we're done. This one with where where this has been um, transferred can you know subsequently be a place where. This can all happen again. Okay. So um, we are left, I remind you, as these glucose molecules are released, again, I will remind you that it's glucose one phosphate. So we need uh, to potentially catalyze the conversion of glucose one phosphate to glucose six phosphate. So, um, and as we know, I've said this a few times now, these, these are the two eventualities, right? Muscle, immediate breakdown, liver, well, whatever needs to happen. So um, you don't have to know this mechanism. It is, uh, uh, the name of the enzyme is, is phosphoglucomutase, and it is kind of interesting to look at what happens here. I like to say for this, what, what, serine, what serine giveth, serine taketh away. <laughs> because I mean, look at what's going on here, right? It gives 
a phosphate, right? To uh, the carbon six position here. And then it simply takes it away from the uh, carbon one position here. And that's it. Thank you, Sarin. And of course, it's ready to do it all over again once this is done because it has a phosphate to give. That's clever. It's like a little factory worker. Okay, so I've mentioned uh, uh, several times here that glucose 6-phosphate can go into the liver, but we've said before um, that glucose 6-phosphate does not readily um, move across cell membranes, right? So we need a specific transporter to get it into the liver cells. And there is something called the G6P transporter. This is going down in the liver only. Other cells don't have this, this G6P transporter, right? So um, we get uh, this transported into uh, the lumen of the cell and uh, glucose 6-phosphate can then be actually through the activity of a membrane-bound phosphatase, it can be released as needed to free glucose and an inorganic phosphate. In turn, if blood glucose needs um, replenishing by the liver, the uh, glucose can then leave the cell via a GLUT2 transporter, ultimately. There are, there's, there's a couple other uh, transporters here, right, to get it back into this, out of the lumen and back into the cytosol. And um, from there, it can go through the GLUT2 transporter and into the bloodstream and uh, level out the blood glucose availability as needed. So clever liver. That's it for glycogenolysis. So much simpler than if you compare that, even though there's some like pretty interesting enzymes, if you compare it to glycolysis, this is a, this is a stroll through the park, right? Two enzymes, glycogen phosphorylase followed by uh, this bifunctional debranching enzyme and uh, then subsequently, phospho, we, should, we cannot forget phosphoglucomutase, right? Because that's playing an important role of converting it to glucose 6-phosphate. Um, things happening in the liver, depending on overall blood glucose concentrations and so forth. Um, and we're done. Okay, what if we want to turn this on its head and start making glycogen? Well, um, we need a couple things. We need a protein primer, interestingly enough, for glycogen synthesis, and an activated glucose precursor. These are two requirements for synthesizing glycogen from glucose. Um, we're going to actually do this kind of in reverse. We're gonna look at the activated glucose precursor first, and then we're gonna talk about the protein primer. Uh, you'll see why that's a little bit backwards as we go through it, but it's, a, it's an okay way to approach it. Um, so in this activated glucose precursor step, individual glucose molecules are actually activated as something called a sugar nucleotide, uh, better known as UDB glucose. And um, these are added to the non-reducing ends of growing linear chains that are found in the outer tiers of these glycogen beta granules. Then a branching enzyme follows that and adds branches periodically. This is the big picture. We're gonna go through all of this in more detail. Okay, what is this creature 
better known as UDP glucose. Well, it's an interesting molecule. What does this look like right here? Looks suspiciously like a, a nucleotide, right? We've got a nitrogenous base. We've got a ribose sugar. We have some phosphate. In my book, that's a nucleotide. In fact, this would be uracil, basically, if it didn't have this. So this is a nucleotide with an additional, I mean, this is this ribose is part of the core structure of a nucleotide, right? But this is a, a glucosyl group um, that is attached to one of these phosphates. So, um, and in fact, the uh, anomeric carbon of this sugar is activated. So this is a glucose basically, right? And it is activated by the attachment of this nucleotide. So this is something a little unusual. We haven't seen this before, right? Uh, and it just shows you, I think to some extent, the versatility of how molecules can be used uh, in biochemistry and in biological processes. So, um, so, What's the deal, chemically speaking? I mean, what is the advantage of having this nucleotide attached to our sugar? Well, there's a few things. One is uh, their formation is metabolically irreversible. So once uh, it's formed, we're not going uh, back until, um, let's say we wanna form glycogen, right? but this is a stable molecule. In, in essence, we're saying this is a very stable molecule, right? Um, the nucleotide part of this, my computer's being temperamental here with the, what just happened? Sorry, for a minute there, I lost my laser pointer. Okay, so, um, Okay, so we said that nucleotide moiety here um, can go undergo a lot of non-covalent interactions with the enzyme. So we like that, get some binding energy out of all this, right? Uh, and then as it turns out, once we get into the enzyme uh, site, active site, this turns out to be a very good leaving group and helps facilitate nucleophilic attack. And then finally, tagging this sugar molecule with this nucleotide group helps distinguish the fate of this hexose, right? It's saying, okay, you're gonna go for glycogen synthesis and not pursue other possible fates for glucose. Okay, so it takes place all over the body, especially prominent in liver and muscle. So the starting point is glucose 6-phosphate and um, that is converted in this case, we're going in reverse, right? And we already said this phosphoglucomutase reaction is reversible. So in this case, we're gonna be going from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose 1-phosphate, and then we get this reaction, which we said is basically irreversible, of glucose 1-phosphate combining um, with UTP, and we're getting UDP glucose and pyrophosphate or inorganic phosphate. Yes. In other words, it's not going to go backwards, but that's not to say that UDP glucose can't go on and, you know, be an activated uh, glucose molecule that's going to engage in glycogen synthesis. Okay, so uh, if glycogen phosphorylase was the breaking down molecule, we now have the building up molecule, which is glycogen synthase. And this is going to 
catalyze the transfer of this UDP glucose, this activated sugar molecule, to a non-reducing end of a branched glycogen molecule. Now, remember, before we get, you know, take a look at all this, remember I, I said we're kind of going out of order here, we're going backwards. This is all based on the uh, situation that we already have an existing glycogen molecule. So we're gonna to have to get into this protein primer thing to see how that nucleus to build up a glycogen molecule is created. But for now, we're just gonna worry about adding UDB glucoses to an existing glycogen molecule. Um, okay, so, and how does this happen? Well, um, we have a non-reducing end, which is not to say that it can't do any chemistry, right? Um, here we're, um, it, it's, it's attacking this phosphate group on this activated sugar molecule. And the um, end result here is we lose the phosphate and we get um, a new non-reducing end. So uh, voila, we have an elongated glycogen molecule now with N plus one. Residues again, our enzyme is glycogen synthase. And we release a UDP molecule in the process, also, of course. I said release phosphate. I should have said release UDP. Okay. So, um, we also have, just like we had a debranching enzyme for post glycogen phosphorylase, just to keep just to keep our eyes on the framework here, right? We have a branching enzyme for um, catalyzing the formation of these alpha one to six bonds found where branches are created. So um, how does that work? Well, this is kind of interesting, right? Let's take a look and try to suss out what is happening here, right? So basically we, re we retain a segment of this molecule here, right? And we take the remaining segment and transfer it to this branch point here. So basically what's this arrow indicating? We're taking, we're taking this part of the molecule here and we're moving it to an alpha one to six linkage at this particular branch point. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the, um, the idea of how we prime the reaction for glycogen synthase to actually act. Um, we have to start somewhere for a new glycogen molecule, right? So glycogenin is the primer on which new chains are assembled. And it's both protein uh, structure and enzyme. So um, it is going to actual, actually catalyze the assembly. So let's just take a look. So for the glycogenin to actually work, um, the first step here is the transfer uh, from UDB glucose. So again, we have a UDB glucose to the hydroxyl group of glycogenesis tyrosine, specifically tyrosine 194. Um, so, so let's just take a look at that, right? So this is a big molecule, right? This is, this is what we just saw right back here, right? This glycogenin, this, this photo. And here's our tyrosine 194, right? So um, this has an OH group and it can actually pick up a glucose molecule from our UDB glucose 
and catalyze really the very first um, glucose molecule that is eventually going to become a whole glycogen structure, right? And then from there, uh, we can have the sequential addition of seven more glucose residues, each once again coming from our UDP glucose. And we keep on extending the chain. Um, well, I say we keep on, we do it for seven residues. It's at that point, once again, one of those kind of, to me, mysteries of biochemistry, you know, why seven residues? Anyway, that's, that's where it stops. And glycogen synthase can then take over and we get more and more additions. And then of course the ent entrance of the branching enzyme and we start to get what looks like a real glycogen structure. Speaking of which, the structure of glycogen. So you can imagine that this is our primer here, right? And um, glycogen chains coming out of this primer, um, we get 12 to 14 residues in these chains in tiers. So, uh, so this should say, this was, this is a little mistake here. Um, the inner chains have two, this should say alpha one to six branches, while the chains in the outer tiers are not branched. So um, just looking at all this. These green are, are uh, no, wait a minute. I think it depends on where we're looking. Yeah, the inner chains, so these inner chains have alpha one to six branches, right? The, the, the green here, although they're calling this the fourth tier. Anyway, you know, to be honest, I'm not, too terribly worried about this, just to give you the general idea that this is a heavily tiered structure with these alpha one to six branches. Each one contains 12 to 14 residues. Um, and ultimately there are 12 tiers, only five are shown here. So uh, we have our primer and then we have, you know, second tier, third tier, fourth tier, etc. Um, this ends up being a pretty large molecule we end up having on the order of 55,000 glucose residues on in a molecule about 21 nanometers in diameter and a molecular weight of uh, 10 to the seven. What is that? That is 10 million Daltons, right? So big molecules. Okay, again, we have a summary at our disposal here. So let's take a look at this, mull this one over for a minute, and then we can go on the break. Uh, we're not going through the whole mechanism here. We'd have to delve into it more, quite frankly. Um, I don't know, but it's something we could definitely look up. It would be interesting to know how that works. All right, why don't you guys just read through this for a minute?
I'll tell you what. Wait. Where is Google? Google is hiding from me. Let's see if we have a mechanism for glycogen. I hate them and it's answered questions. <laughs> Probably hideously complicated. See if Wikipedia has any insight on it. May or may not. Yep, <laughs> pretty short article. <laughs> oh no, they're letting us down. Okay, forget you, Wikipedia. This might be something where you'd have, oh, here we go. Something for, for us on the break. Oh no, this is the synthase mechanism. That doesn't do us any good. Back it up. This might be something where you'd have to go to the literature to really suss this one out. Okay, so we're on break officially until 2.45. Okay, so now that we have learned something about uh, the enzymes that are uh, responsible for glycogen breakdown or synthesis, i.e. glycogen phosphorylase and glycogen synthase, we want to understand how these are regulated. Um, sometimes we might want to form glycogen from excess glucose, and other times we might want to release glucose from glycogen when needed. So as we saw for glycolysis versus gluconeogenesis, there are hormones that are involved in this regulation. In fact, the same hormones, we didn't talk about epinephrine before, but we did talk about glucagon and insulin. So uh, here, glucagon and epinephrine are going to stimulate the breakdown of glycogen, and here insulin is going to uh, uh, activate glycogen synthase right, and, and inhibit glycogen phosphorylase. So um, this is through mechanisms such as those we've already seen, allosteric regulation and phosphorylation states of either these synthetic enzymes or ones involved in degradation. Okay, so glycogen phosphorylase, uh, 
um, is uh, subject to regulation by phosphorylation. So this is can get confusing, right? Because the enzyme itself, which is called phosphorylase, is being controlled by phosphorylation. So um, as mentioned, it's hormone stimulated. Now, it has two interconvertible forms. The A form, which is phosphorylated and catalytically, catalytically active, and the B form, which is dephosphorylated. Now, the one thing I don't want you to get confused about here is it sounds like we have two different enzymes. You might think of A and B as being two different uh, types of enzyme or some kind of bifunctional enzyme. It's not. It's just glycogen phosphorylase. Um, and when it gets phosphorylated, it's known as the A form. So um, what, uh, oh, interesting, this figure is backwards. See what's wrong with this figure? I copied it from somewhere on the internet without noticing. Yeah, it should be, these arrows should be in the opposite direction. <laughs> Can't believe everything you read on the internet. So this goes this way, right? Kinase, it gets phosphorylated. And this goes this way. This would be phosphatase activity, right? Okay, so catalytically active when phosphorylated means we'll take glycogen and we'll break it down to glucose. We can take uh, a closer look at this and also investigate the relationship of these enzymes to triggering phosphorylation. So there are two subunits of this enzyme, both of which have phosphorylation sites in the form of OH groups that arise from serine residues. So let me just get rid of this, annoys me. So, um, and as noted, it is the ac action of phosphorylase uh, kinase that will lead to this phosphorylation. What stimulates it? Well, epinephrine or glucagon trigger the phosphorylation process um, through the activity of this phosphorylase kinase. So, um, glucagon or epinephrine. You may have heard of epinephrine in terms of like the fight or flight response. So, um, but uh, it does indicate we need a ready source of energy, whether we're fighting or flighting. Um, so, uh, notice that, of course, the reverse is dephosphorylation by a phosphatase. So that is going to return it to its inactive form. I think I, I've, I was, I've never done this before, but I was thinking that this could be an interesting time to sort of compare and contrast with glycolysis. And to give you a little refresher on something we talked about the last time, which is this, right? So, whoops, what just happened? Did not want that. Okay, you may recall that last time we talked about, in fact, a truly bifunctional enzyme that responds to either glucagon or insulin, right? So we can kind of compare these two things. Like we not only need to break down glycogen, when we need energy, but we also break down glucose, right? They're part and parcel of the same thing. But what's interesting in this case, just by way of review, this is this bifunctional enzyme that has a PFK function and an FB pace function, right? And this is a complicated one. So I thought it'd be worth going over a second time since I didn't really do this slide. Now, the overall big picture here is if fructose 2,6-bisphosphate
goes up, we activate glycolysis, right? So when there are high levels of insulin, since we were just talking about insulin, this promotes the dephosphorylation of our enzyme by functional enzyme. Why? Because when this is dephosphorylated, no P, I'm going to say, this PFK2 then takes fructose 6-phosphate as its substrate and makes fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which activates glycolysis, right? So in this case, we have the dephosphorylation of, in response, let me, let me start from the beginning. In response to high levels of insulin, we get dephosphorylation of an enzyme through protein phosphatase. When that makes PFK2 active, that raises the level of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and activates glycolysis. In the thing that we just looked at, it's the other way around, right? In terms of glycogen, high levels of insulin. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, I was talking about glucagon, wasn't I? Well, it doesn't really matter because I was thinking I was talking about glucagon. But let's look, let's take this same slide and think about this in the context of insulin. So if we have insulin, I got to go back. Yes, okay. Stimulates glycolysis. What do we want to have happen? If we have high levels of insulin, we promote glycolysis, right? Would you agree? If we have high, this is where things get interesting. If we have high levels of insulin, do we want to promote glycogen breakdown or glycogen synthesis? synthesis? Synthesis, right? So on the one hand, insulin will be promoting a catabolic activity because we have plentiful supplies of glucose. We might as well break it down, right? But we're also going to take some of that and we're going to make glycogen because we not, might not even be able to break all of it down, right? We might have so much glucose floating around that some of it needs to go towards synthesis. So insulin here is going to do what? You tell me, what's it going to promote? looking at the figure. Dephosphorylation, what's that gonna prevent? Glycogen breakdown. As we go forward, we could make the prediction that we're going to see insulin stimulates glycogen, the active form of glycogen synthase, right? So I'm just doing, you know, I've never done this before, go back and forth between these two things, but it's kind of good to like try to make a comprehensive picture of all this, right? Okay. So right now we're looking at this 
in the context of if we have low blood sugar, glucagon is going to activate the phosphorylation of this enzyme, which is going to activate phosphorylase and help us break down glycogen, okay? Okay, everyone good so far? In terms of this glucagon pathway, we can see something interesting that we really haven't seen before. We have not talked a lot about signaling in this course. And there's a ton of molecules out there that are involved in signaling that typically uh, involve some kind of binding molecule and some kind of receptor. That's a foundation of signaling, right? You have to have that. So in this case, we're going to see how epinephrine or glucagon can be involved in signal amplification through something called an enzyme cascade. So either of these hormones can bind to something, to some cell membrane surface receptor, typically something called the beta adrenergic receptor. And this in turn activates something called a GTP binding protein. So this leads to a whole chain of events, which is all about an enzyme cascade amplifying this uh, initial signal through successive steps. So let's just um, trace the pathway. Um, first ATP through this enzyme adenylylcyclase raises the levels of cyclic AMP or CM. And each time we get some factor, it varies, um, but some increase in the number of molecules that will in turn affect subsequent molecules in, of course, an amplified way. Because if we have 20 CMs making, each of them making 10 active PKAs, we're amplifying the signal each time, right? So, um, okay. So we go from cyclic AMP and we activate PKA, a phosphorylase kinase molecule. And we just saw that molecule. Let's just remind ourselves that it was a PK, a kinase molecule that is, I guess it's PKB here. Wait a minute, let me go back. Yeah, PKA doesn't really matter. We're gonna have a PKB here, in fact. But in any event, um, we're just going on down the road here and we're continuing to activate, right? This is PKB. Okay, this is inactive. So PKA phosphorylates, uh, promotes the phosphorylation of PKB. Okay. <laughs> It gets a little crazy because, yeah, I, I don't know if you're seeing the levels here. Um, this molecule here is PKB, right? And this is actually our phosphorylase B inactive. But P, the, 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 the thing that's so, so, so PKB itself is activated by PKA, okay? Do you see that now? So... PKA activates PKB. It has an inactive and active form, right? It gets activated here. That in turn activates our phosphorylase to the A form. Moral of the story, we get an amplification or, it, uh, you know, in terms of the production of glucose by a factor of 10,000 times greater than we would normally. Just a lot. Okay, so... And this needs to happen. I mean, if you're suddenly out there, you know, sprinting, doing the 500 yard dash or fleeing the lion or something, uh, you want this kind of signal amplification. 
Okay, so um, there are also allosteric levels of modification for these enzymes. So we just looked at uh, phosphorylation as a criteria for activating phosphorylase A. Um, what if glucose levels are high? Well, we know insulin potentially is going to play a role, but glucose itself can bind to an allosteric site on the activated phosphorylase A enzyme, right? Note, notice these two little phosphorylations here, right? This actually, this being an allosteric uh, situation, changes the conformation of the enzyme and exposes these phosphorylated serine residues to the action of the phosphatase, okay? Which is the dephosphorylator. Also notice, remember how I said before that insulin activates dephosphorylation, so inhibits uh, the activity of phosphorylase B. We see that more clearly here. Insulin is also going to activate glycogen synthase. But you know, when you're when you're reviewing this stuff, I think if you just think as a think about first principles first, if that makes any sense. I mean, think about what high glucose would mean in terms of what you want to do metabolically. And then the rest will kind of follow from that, right? So, um, okay. So between glucose, up, insulin, up, we're going to promote the less active form of the glycogen phosphorylase. And we're not gonna break down glycogen anymore. I had a question on the previous slide. Uh, this one? Yeah. So if um, cyclic AMP activates PKA, is PKA then called PKA? Or no, they're two different enzymes. Those are in fact two different enzymes, okay? So PKB is what's responsible for phosphorylating uh, glycogen phosphorylase. Oh, I never mind, I got it, it all clicked. Yeah, yeah, so I tried to point that out here. PKA actually stimulates PKB because PKB itself can be phosphorylated or dephosphorylated. Here and here, so. Oh, okay, <laughs> no problem. Okay, so now we can take a look at glycogen synthase. And guess what? <laughs> also subject to phosphorylation. So, um, and the beauty of this, this is what's pretty brilliant here, is glycogen synthase A is unphosphorylated when it is catalytically activated and synthase B is inactive when phosphorylated. So the reason I say this is kind of clever is if you think about glycogen phosphorylase, we just said that it is active when phosphorylated, right? And inactive when dephosphorylated. So since glycogen synthase is the opposite, active when dephosphorylated, phosphorylation will be activating phosphorylase at the same time it would inactivate synthase, which is smart, right? Because one technique, <laughs> one to rule them all here, right? Very Lord of the Rings. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so this, and it helps remember too, I think, you know, that glycogen phosphorylase has its own set of rules while glycogen synthase has the opposite rules. So, okay, so 
when unphosphorylated, it is catalytically active, excuse me, and uh, phosphorylated and inactive unless glucose 6-phosphate is present. We'll worry about that later. Okay, so unlike um, Uzi Watsi, unlike glycogen phosphorylase, it can be phosphorylated on a lot of different, by a lot of different kinases, phosphorylated on various residues by a lot of different kinases. I don't know if uh, you know how many glycogen, glycogen phosphorylase might have in particular, but this one is like very promiscuous, shall we say, in terms of its uh, <laughs> its willingness to be phosphorylated by different kinases. Um, but there is one that is most important, and this is called glycogen synthase kinase three or GSK three. It does, in fact, add phosphoryl groups to serine residues to three serine residues, which strongly inactivates the enzyme. Okay, so let's take a look at GSK and understand the activity of insulin, which we know by definition, even if we didn't understand the process fully, we know by definition insulin must want to activate this enzyme. And how would it do it? Well, since GSK3 is an inactivator, right? Since it, we know it phosphorylates the A form to convert it to the B form, insulin would have, should have the role of inhibiting that, right? Because we want synthase A to be active. So, okay, so it prevents this whole GSK3 being able to take ATP um, and transferring some of its phosphoryl groups here. But it also actually activates the dephosphorylation process by protein phosphatase one, phosphatase one, PP one. Okay, glucose six phosphate is also an activator because you know just plenty of glucose around, right, to make glycogen. Uh, glucagon and epinephrine, on the other hand, inhibit the activity of the protein phosphatase, which would tend to maintain this in uh, its active state. Now, an interesting question might be, do glucagon and epinephrine activate GSK3? Because it's not shown in this figure, right? but I only have so much trust for these figures. So I'm trying, sometimes, <laughs> truly, sometimes they're trying to highlight, you know, uh, uh, one thing and, you know, so you just never know. Like if we go back to this figure, right? Look at this one. I said insulin, you know, well, let me be extra fancy here and do green. Insulin is an activator of PPI, PP, protein phosphatase here, and it is. It's not shown here, probably just because in this figure they're focusing on the role of glucagon um, and they don't want too many greens, right? Uh, but logically speaking, we know that uh, insulin would likely promote the presence of phosphorylase in its inactive state. And we do see that in this figure here. We show it, it's actively shown being activated PP1 here. So arguably, glucagon and epinephrine may be 
activating for GSK3. Do I know for sure my money would be on it, but you know, like it would follow the logic, right? Okay, so we have situations in life. Those situations could be the well-fed state, probably something you're not in right now. <laughs> no one seems to eat lunch before coming here. Do you guys eat lunch before coming here? No, okay. Fasting, I don't know if you're quite fasting, but you're probably getting pretty hungry at this point. Uh, maybe you're breaking down a little glycogen right now. Who knows? All that brain energy. Um, or the fight or flight response, which I don't think anyone is like going to run out of the room momentarily, but who knows? Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we know these are signaled by the hormones that we've been talking about, right? Insulin, glucagon, epinephrine. So um, we want to maybe distinguish between what goes on in the liver and what goes on in the muscle. So the liver is the main site for, we're not, I mean, this could happen. We, we can't over make too much of a dichotomy of this, right? But the liver is more in the business of making glycogen than muscles are. So we can say that in the liver, insulin activates glycogen synthase while glucagon stimulates glycogen breakdown. Well, some of this can also certainly happen in the muscle. Um, epinephrine doesn't tend to act in the liver, okay? Um, epinephrine would more, be more likely to stimulate glycogen breakdown and glycolysis in the muscle. Okay, so let's look at the well-fed state. And figure out what's going on here. So this is high blood glucose, right? We have, yeah, fasting. I wanna look at fasting for a moment because I wanna see if what I was talking about before where they weren't showing, what was I saying back here? I was saying that potentially glucagon would, I don't think they're gonna show that here, but I don't know. I was saying glucagon would, Yeah, they don't show the GSK3 here. Anyway, doesn't matter. So um, let's, let's go back to well-fed state here. Insulin um, is gonna do what? Well, we know that it's gonna In terms of, let, let's focus on one thing at a time. In terms of glycogen phosphorylase, it's going to raise the levels of a protein kinase that is subject to insulin regulation, right? That in turn is going to raise the protein phosphatase activities, that's going to, in turn, lower any activity by phosphorylase kinase and return glycogen to its dephosphorylated form. I mean, yeah, dephosphorylated form and we're gonna have less glycogen breakdown. In terms of glycogen synthesis, we want to lower the activity of 
GSK3, right? because we don't want it phosphorylating glycogen synthase because it's active in its dephosphorylated form. So that will raise glycogen synthesis. And the end result is we're gonna inhibit glycogen breakdown and we're going to raise glycogen synthesis. Now, this is in the hepatocyte. So we're not, going to talk about insulin in the context here of what I shifted us to a moment ago, which is how insulin regulates, uh, encourages glycolysis through PFK2, FBPase2, right? Yes? Okay. What it is going to do is it's going to uh, stimulate the release of uh, glucose into the liver, actually. We're going to send blood glucose hmm. Now, wait a minute. Thinking here. Well, it's going to stimulate if we get glucose into the liver, we're going to have glycogen synthesis, right? And then, of course, um, we'll also have the stimulation of glycolysis. So that is the well-fed state. Just follow the yellow brick road here. Is everyone cool with this? And this is just on the transcriptional level, this part here. So the end, I guess what, what to think about here in the end is we get in the well-fed state, we get glycogen breakdown, glycogen synthesis and in which I'm not sure everyone was getting was this well-fed state is not showing the role of uh, fructose 2,6 bisphosphate and its control by insulin, you know, because this is levels of this are increased by the presence of insulin and that's not being shown here in any way, is all I'm saying. Fair? Okay. Uh, now, between meals or fasting, you right now. Oh, I've gone over time. Sorry. <laughs> We're almost, we're pretty much almost done with this. Um, next, tomorrow we will move on to, gosh, do you guys want it? This makes sound crazy. You probably don't want to. I was gonna say, take the test on Monday. <laughs> the only thing about that is because we've, we've now pretty much, tomorrow we'll have definitely covered all the material. I'm just saying the fourth exam is going to come very fast. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I know it's a lot. I have a double check on something. Oh, okay. Okay. Forget it. So, but what's going to happen is tomorrow and Monday, we're going to move on to material that's going to be on the fourth exam. I don't know, maybe you should take the exam tomorrow. <laughs> I do have a homework. I have a citric acid cycle homework for you guys. I, I've been, but I haven't, we haven't covered the citric acid cycle. <laughs> I really have to, I don't have a, a glucose, a metabolism. I'm gonna develop a homework, but for for uh, glycolysis and all this stuff, but I, I, so it won't be due on, well, I guess I will have to make it due on, this Sunday, because otherwise there's no point. In order to get you ready for the test, I mean, it doesn't have to be Sunday. I can make it to Monday or something after your double check. <laughs> but I, I, there's, I want to work up a homework, and I just, I haven't done it yet. Okay, see you guys tomorrow.